Cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm Mike. I'm an engineer at Intercom. And uh, today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about uh, a recent, really experimental feature that we built at Intercom. And also, a little bit about the engineering principles and the technology stack that we use uh, to help us build our product. So a really big part of Intercom is our in-app messenger. Uh, and this is the chat widget that you see on the right-hand side here. And this is embedded onto all of our customers' websites. Uh, it lets them have conversations with their users right there in the context of their app. And it works uh, a little bit like WhatsApp. So with it, you can communicate with text, emojis, stickers, images, etc. And recently, uh, I was looking at adding another medium for our users to communicate in, video. So messaging with video is a brand new feature, which we added really recently. Uh, it's not even fully released yet. And it lets you respond in a conversation by recording a video uh, right there inside the Intercom app, which the person you're talking to sees pop up straight away in front of them. And as well as being new, it's also a little bit of an unusual feature from a development point of view. Because the roadmap of what we build at Intercom comes roughly equally from five different strands. So we iterate on our current features. Uh, we add new ones to solve customer problems. Uh, we improve feature quality. And we work on scalability to help scale with increasing numbers of users. But we also make sure to allow some time to innovate. Uh, to experiment with brand new ideas. And these are bets that we make on new concepts uh, based on how we think communication is evolving. And video messaging was one of these kinds of ideas. Uh, our customers weren't asking for it. No one thought it was a really obvious thing we needed to add. Uh, instead, the idea came from asking kind of the same question that drives all of our products, which is, how can we make internet business more personal and this time, we started off by asking ourselves, how can we bring face-to-face -face interactions to the web? Of course, lots of products already give you some sort of face-to-face -face experience with video calls, uh, but they're high friction. Uh, both people have to be online at the same time. It's not a casual interaction. It's something people typically arrange ahead of time. And what we're imagining is a little different. Uh, video messaging from browser to browser. So as personal as a call, uh, but something which works either synchronously or asynchronously. So this is core to the way that internet communication is evolving. Uh, part of a conversation may happen synchronously in real time when both people are online. Think of an IM conversation, uh, while other parts spread asynchronously over minutes, hours, or maybe even days. And all of our features are designed with this pattern in mind. So how does this actually come about? Well, one of our designers thinks up an idea of how sending a video might feel. Uh, you just hold down the space bar, say, hey, thanks, and then you let go to send. Cool, so we work. Good morning. Uh, we work figuring out whether we can make this concept real. And so the first thing we do is we build a really simple prototype. So this is half a mock-up, half a tech demo. Uh, and we use this to answer two questions. Does this actually feel cool? And is it technically possible? So the technical side is naturally the first thing we look at. Recording video in the browser is not a well-trodden path. Uh, it still varies really widely across different browsers and environments. So we started off on Firefox, uh, which implements the HTML5 WebRDC APIs, which we're looking for. Uh, in this case, it's the Media Recorder APIs. So when this is implemented in the browser, it means the browser itself does the heavy lifting for us. Uh, so it captures video and audio, muxes them together, and turns them into a usable video file. But most of our users are on Chrome, uh, which for once is behind the curve. It doesn't implement Media Recorder. Uh, it has decent supports for some other part of the WebRTC APIs, so we can get access to the camera and mic stream, no problem. Uh, however, to turn this into a video file, we need to build it out of the raw camera stream ourselves. So we have a go and see if we can work around this and still record video natively in the browser. And we find out with a little work, it's very possible. You add a JavaScript recorder in the background, which snapshots the video and audio streams in real time, uh, collects up all the frames, and then compiles them into binary media files on the fly in JavaScript. So this sounds pretty ambitious and daunting. Uh, it maybe even a little crazy, or at least it sounded like that to me at first. Uh, but with today's APIs, Manipulating media streams in the browser is a lot more feasible than you might think. So to get our initial recorder, 
working, we found that we could just glue together the WebRTC APIs with some existing open source libraries. So the WebRTC APIs are pretty well supported across browsers, and they give us access to the device's raw camera feeds. They're really intended for streaming and video calls, not entirely intended for recording. But we glued these together with some open source libraries for encoding video client side. And pretty quickly, we find that our prototype actually works pretty nicely. Great. Uh, so we have a prototype working. We validated that it's technically feasible. And then we start playing with it and recording some videos. And it becomes clear pretty quickly that, yes, this does feel cool. Of course, as you all know, a prototype is great. But it's not the same thing as a finished product. Uh, so we start work trying to turn this into something real. It's still an experiment at this point. Uh, we might still have missed something that does actually make it technically impossible. And ultimately, we still don't know if it's even a good idea or if anyone's going to use this at the end. Uh, but our strong belief is the best way to find this out is to go ahead and build it. Of course, we hit a couple more snags. For one thing, you might think that making a video available is a lot like any other type of file, that we could upload the video to Intercom, and then Intercom makes it available for all of our users to watch. Uh, but it turns out it's a little more complicated. So videos come in lots of different encodings. Uh, to get reliable playback by every client, you can't just send out the raw recorded file for people to watch. Uh, it needs to be transcoded into the right encoding first. And every service working with video deals with this problem. Uh, it's such a common problem, in fact, that there's a whole sector of third-party services out there which you can use just to transcode your video. And we're fully expecting to use one of these services because it makes sense to. We prefer to buy over build where possible and just own less software. But video transcoding is not usually something which needs to happen in real time. So all these third-party services operate on a different model. Uh, you give them some work to do, then sometime later, maybe it's 30 seconds, maybe it's 60 seconds, maybe it's two minutes, they publish the result back to you. And this doesn't work for us. Uh, our videos can be part of a real-time conversation. Think of that WhatsApp image at the very start. Uh, you can be instant messaging with someone, record a video reply, and then follow up right away with some more IMs. Uh, if your video takes even 30 seconds to be ready, it breaks that flow. It no longer feels like a real-time conversation. So at this point, it's getting a little hard to achieve our original vision. Uh, we could have compromised on the user experience here and said, videos aren't like other messages. They're non-real-time. Uh, they're not consistent with how everything else works in Intercom. Uh, but we're not really ever willing to sacrifice the user experience like that. We could have also seen this as an exit ramp. It's a point where we could easily say, hey, we've discovered all the technical problems, and we found out that actually it's going to be too difficult to have this in Intercom. And maybe stopping here would be the pragmatic choice. Uh, after all, we don't even know at this point if anyone will use it if we build it. Uh, but we have an explicit budget for experimentation to try to make new things work. Uh, and we're encouraged to use it. So we keep going. And we start looking at an angle that we didn't originally expect to take, which is whether we can build real-time transcoding ourselves. So when we first started talking about doing this, uh, there were a few good questions we had to ask ourselves. There are whole companies dedicated to just doing transcoding. That's their whole business. Uh, are we really going to take that on just as a sideline for just one feature? But we had a few advantages here compared to the general problem those other companies are solving. Uh, our videos are always short. We don't care a ton about high def quality. We care a lot more about turnaround. So rather than solving the general problem, uh, we can try to optimize here for our really specific use case. So we start looking at how we can build a really stripped down uh, service to do this. And, and when I say stripped down, I mean really stripped down. Uh, so we start with FFmpeg, which, as you're probably aware, is kind of the Swiss Army knife of command line tools for media encoding. And we start playing with its settings to see how fast we can make transcoding happen. So its default setting, which is lossless, gives us transcoding times of maybe 30 seconds or more for our sample inputs. Uh, those times are pretty much identical to what something like AWS Elastic Transcoder can give us, which I'm sure is totally coincidental. Uh, other third-party services gave us similar sorts of turnaround times. But as I mentioned earlier, though, we care about quick turnaround, not quality. And there are a lot of knobs that we can turn on FFmpeg to tune for that. Uh, so we tune those knobs, 
uh, and you manage to get this time down to just a couple of seconds, which is critically fast enough to feel real time. So by this point, we saw that we could do real time transcoding, uh, but we still needed to build the infrastructure to do it. And our biggest concern now was operational. Uh, video transcoding is pretty CPU intensive. We don't want it to be able to possibly interfere with anything else we do, like serving our normal critical API requests. So this argues pretty strongly for making something its own microservice with its own hardware for isolation. But let's remember, this is just one feature in an app full of them. Uh, we need to do more than just make this service work. If the feature is going to have a dedicated service behind it, we need to make sure it's operationally quiet. And this is one of our core infrastructure principles, uh, zero touch ops. So if infrastructure needs regular engineer effort from our ops team to keep it going, that's not going to scale for us. So the best way to make it zero touch and operationally quiet is to design it from the very beginning for simplicity. It should be simple, stateless, and dumb. And so that's exactly what we went for. Uh, we wrapped FFmpeg with a tiny rail server, which had no backend at all, simple and stateless. And it was dumb, too. It just offered a set of endpoints which made no decisions at all, just a pure function, taking input from a given S3 file, uh, writing that transcoded output out to a given path in S3. And being simple, stateless, and dumb, uh, it's really easy to set this up in AWS to auto-scale based on the input request load. So even as the request load grows 10x or 100x, there's no need for humans in the loop to change anything. So you might figure that I'm glossing over a little bit of complexity here uh, about spinning up new infrastructure. Doesn't that take a lot of work? Well, yeah, usually this isn't something you can just do overnight. Uh, even when you're running entirely in AWS, which I'm willing to bet the majority of you probably are, uh, you or your ops team are going to need to set up EC2 images, uh, ELBs, load, uh, monitoring, testing, configuration, auto-scaling groups. It's fiddly work, uh, it's easy to screw up, and it's time that you spend not adding features for your customers. So this is the point where I mentioned Muster, which is our continuous deployment tool. Uh, it's a tool we built in-house to continuously deploy all of our code, but it also manages uh, and creates all the AWS infrastructure involved in every one of our services. So this means it takes care of new service creation. Uh, when an engineer wants to add, add some service, we don't need to go and wade into the AWS console or start writing some chef scripts to set up hosts. Uh, we just create a new repo in GitHub, add it to Muster, and all the infrastructure, those EC2 instances, auto-scaling groups, load balancers, et cetera, is auto-created and managed by it. And this has a really significant impact uh, because it enables good behavior. So sometimes it's technically the right thing to do to set up a new service, but if you make it hard and high effort for engineers to do the right thing, you're going to see them doing the wrong thing more often. Uh, so Muster ends up being pretty core to the way we develop because it facilitates this. And how it actually works is that it runs whenever an engineer merges the change to the master branch of one of our repos on GitHub. GitHub then fires off a webhook to Muster, which builds up that repo and prepares that code into a form that's ready for deployment. And it also fires a webhook off to CodeShip. Uh, they're an external service who run all of our regression tests for us that make sure there's no regressions from existing behavior. So once those tests have run successfully, uh, CodeShip notifies Muster, and the code gets pushed out to our production environment. So even for our largest services, the time this takes from a change being pushed to master, fr from a change being pushed to master to having it fully deployed is less than 10 minutes. And we found that this fully automatic approach to deployment and infrastructure really works. Uh, so this graph is from our internal deployment dashboard. It shows how many times we deployed the main intercom service every day for the last three years. Uh, we've gone from deploying about 10 times a day back in 2012 to over 80 times a day now. And this makes life easier for us in a lot of different ways. It uh, keeps our feedback loop and iteration loop short. We see the results of our work delivered to customers in minutes, not days. Uh, it makes deployments uneventful, because when you're deploying constantly, uh, deployments are never a big deal. And also, it enables good engineer behavior. If something's broken in production and you need to fix it, you just push code and let the system deploy as normal. There's no hacking around to fix an outage. And in the case of our video replies feature, as we saw, it also enables good behavior when building new services. Uh, because it makes the barrier to creating a new service lower, it means there's less disincentive for engineers to do the right thing just to save a little bit of time. So of course, we didn't just use this to continuously deploy the transcoder service I was talking about. Uh, we also used it from the very first week to ship all of this code. Uh, that's the client-side code, the APIs behind it, and the back-end services that support it uh, to production continuously. So it was hidden for anyone outside of Intercom, but the whole time we were developing, this code was deployed and usable. And that's how we always like to ship features like this. So we started off shipping the most basic possible version 
Uh, it just recorded a video in the app with no sounds, and then it attached it as a file. You had to click the thing to open it in a new tab. Uh, it's pretty crude. Uh, and it was pre-transcoders, didn't have any compatibility across browsers. However, it worked end to end. Uh, you could log into our real app, you could click to record a video, and you could exercise the whole flow and send it to one of our coworkers, you know, sort of from week one. And even though it didn't have sound, uh, some people on my team found some uses for those videos anyway. And then over time, we shipped some sound support, the new rendering logic to make the videos play back in line, rather than just being a link that you click on. So you can see how things started to slowly come together here. And then with a little more work later, uh, it's a smooth player, starting to look pretty decent. And then after a little more continuous shipping, uh, we have a really nice recording experience too. Uh, it's slick enough for our real customers to start using it. And so at that point, we were able to unflag it so that uh, it was no longer us internally who only saw it, and then uh, our beta testers started using it as well. And this brings us pretty much up to the present day, uh, to the place we're at right now, where now we get to find out how people use it. Uh, now we get to start learning about video messaging in business communications, the same way we already learned about how people use email, IM, emojis, and everything else to communicate. And this phase is just beginning. So this feature has only been released to a couple hundred of our beta test users, uh, but we're already getting a ton of feedback from them on how they use it. Uh, here are some of the videos our customers, customers recorded over the last few weeks uh, since this feature was released to beta. And uh, we got permission from all these folks to use their footage. So we see some people, oh, this is not playing. Well, that's unfortunate, but <laughs> we see some people are sending fun, whimsical messages, and other people are using it to narrate live demos. Uh, so even though it's really early in the life of this, uh, we think our video messaging is turning out to be really promising. Uh, and we're really excited to see what people do with it. But even beyond this one feature, uh, from an engineering point of view, Testing, testing, we're back. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, audio glitches aside, this uh, story also serves to illustrate some of the principles uh, that we use to attack engineering problems. Uh, so in your dev team, your mileage may vary, but uh, these are some practices that we find really powerful in Intercom. Uh, so how did we use these to attack this problem? Well, first, uh, we started with the simplest possible version and iterated from there. So this is almost a cliche at this point when you're talking about building software, uh, but that doesn't make it any less critical or any less true. And it isn't just true for tiny little soft startups. Uh, whatever size your organization is, one engineer or a thousand, uh, this is still vital. And secondly, we really deliberately built an end-to-end -end version first in order to flush out hard problems. Uh, this just tackled the essential parts. It ignored all the easy detail that we knew we could implement later. So when building something new, you really don't want to spend a bunch of time building all its individual components, and then much later you try to connect them up into a working feature. Uh, you're guaranteed to miss things. You'll only flush them out when you're putting it live and hooking it up for real. So instead, we put our simplest possible prototype out there into production. We get it working end to end. And finally, the fast iteration isn't just about tweaking divs on the front end. Uh, so we made sure via our tooling that it's really easy for the same engineers who are working on a product feature that a customer is going to see right in front of them to also iterate on the infrastructure behind those features. So if it's hard for product engineers to deal with infrastructure, uh, either because of poor tooling or because you need to jump through some organizational hoops to do it, you're not enabling engineers to build the best possible solutions. Or even worse, you might see some features not built at all because people don't feel like they can build the infrastructure that those features need. So if that's too many words, maybe I can sum this up into one idea which really captures how we build these features, which is to engineer vertical slices. This is totally analogous to the concept you're probably all familiar with from product development, and it holds for engineering too, really anywhere where you have unknowns that you want to validate. So in any project, there's lots of different layers that need to come together. Uh, here we have to deal with recording, transcoding, our internal data storage, rendering the video for end users. So rather than trying to do any of these well up front, uh, we focused on a really minimal version, which cut across all of these layers, which forced us to discover and flush out all the big hard problems. So this approach has worked really well for us in this feature and others, and uh, I'm really hopeful that it would work really well for you guys too. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you for the great presentation. So we have a time for maybe uh, one or two questions. Does anybody want? Yeah. Right, uh, so the question was whether we have a cap on the length of a video that's enforced. Um, so this is something that we, we talked about, whether to put a hard cap or a soft cap on this, because definitely the intent is to have like short, snappy messages. Um, but you run into something interesting when you try to put a hard cap on it, which is what we were thinking about doing at first, which is um, if you put a hard cap on, you have this really difficult user experience for the moment when the cap is coming up. You know, you have to give them some sort of flashing idea that this is, this is just about to finish. Um, so actually what we went with in the end for this, and I guess it's something that we're, we're still kind of trialing out, is we have a, an implicit soft cap in the sense that the physical experience that you have is in order to record this video, you need to hold down your space bar. And that kind of puts this interesting, uh, really practical limit on how long people are willing to, willing to hold that button in order to do this. Um, so I guess in an infrastructural sense, probably if you tried to send you know, some hours of video through this because you're hacking around with their API or something, you know, that's, that's not going to work out because it's not well supported. But the primary method that we use to limit the length of customers' videos is that sort of uh, self-enabled soft cap on, hey, how long am I willing to sit here uh, holding down record, right? Cool. Hey. Um First of all, thanks for your talk. It was very interesting. I, I have a question about uh, how you capture media. I mean, I'm, obviously, you support browsers which support get using media, so it's Firefox, Chrome, and probably Edge. And um, you said that in Chrome, for example, you actually take snapshots of uh, video stream, probably like from Canvas, and then encode to VP9 or probably WebM, whatever, on the client side, and then send it for transcoding. Isn't it like you know offloading all these CPU-heavy uh, stuff to client side. Probably it will make your Mac to took off because of the fans cooling down your CPU. Why don't you use like full WebRTC peer to peer connection and capture on server side and transcode there? Thanks. Sure, yeah. Uh, so that was definitely an approach that we looked at, right? Like a very, a very traditional RTC approach would be to essentially take, uh, take the stream, stream it out in real time over the network to some back end server, which will you continuously receive this, uh, record it, and encode it. Um, so one of the really interesting things is I think that we really want to build for this, uh, you know, the, the future of HTML5 APIs, which we see like really nicely right now in Firefox, which is this, this paradigm that the browser does this locally, it does it well, and again, calling back to what we talked about earlier about simplicity, uh, it means that we don't have, say, some uh, component with, say, long-lived connections on the back end that needs to be continuously streaming from an operational point of view. Instead, we with, with modern browsers, we get this really, really nice, elegant interface where the browser just packages up a video, and at some point that is like atomically posted off, essentially, in, in a single request. Um, and I really think that this is, uh, you know, you can see it in Firefox right now, that this is like the future, this media recorder API, and we're also really close to seeing it land in public Chrome. So it's being developed in Chromium right now. Uh, I think it's, you know, available under dash dash blazing experimental or something. Um, but it's a really valid question. Like, we definitely could have gone down either of these routes. Uh, I think from a lot of operational points of view, there's uh, a lot of correctness and simplicity advantages to doing this. And in terms of offloading the CPU load to the browsers, um, it's kind of a valid concern. But you know, when you look at it in the real world on real machines, it's not something which really impacts us or really impacts the customer. Extend a little bit because it starts late. Yeah. Can I just get this mic? Um, we use your service, uh, but as it's a small team, most of the time the communication is not instant because there's people just not available to answer things instantly. So generally, we're getting notifications through email um, from the messenger. So how how does this feature look in the email notifications. Right, yeah, so uh, taking on from kind of the minimal vertical slice, this will, uh, in an email notification, essentially 
send you something out which uh, links back to the media file which you, you can open. So uh, it works with an email notification, but it, currently it isn't, say, inlined into the email. There's a lot of interesting challenges there around, yeah, I mean, I, I'm not sure how portably possible that would be even, even in the ultimate case. Uh, so we, we haven't done too more, much work yet to make that a really friendly experience in the email notification, but the whole flow will still work. You just will have to go outside of your email client in order to view it. Hi. Uh, so I was wondering how long did it take to actually build that feature from when you got the idea to when you pushed it to production and how many people were working on it? Right. Uh, it's a really good question. So from the very start, the, the concept stage that I talked about, which was you know absolutely just words and pictures of how we thought that was going to go, uh, until the point where we had this in production being used by our real customers was about two months. Uh, and so the time until we had something in production was about one week. So we started off with the concept. We did a very little bit of local hacking to sort of validate these methods. And then like, we integrated that into our app you know, pretty, pretty quickly, like the end of that week. Just again, feature flagged and hidden behind barriers so that only we could see it internally. Uh, and in terms of uh, people working on it, uh, so there was uh, some design and product managers who worked on this part-time. In terms of engineering, uh, it was pretty, pretty much just myself. <laughs> 